Uh, so good afternoon, everyone, and happy Valentine's Day. The other pink shirts up there. No? Yeah, close enough. Um, yeah, some of you are going to run out to call their spouse. <laughs> uh, I'm John Field. I'm the Executive Secretary here at the Pacific Salmon Commission. Very good to see all of you back here in Portland. Uh, it's always a fun place for us to come and convene. Uh, very grateful to uh, the U.S. for making this available and uh, looking forward to the talk to some of you as the days go by. Uh, so I want to welcome you to the latest installment in the PSC seminar series. That's a series that's been offered about once a month over the last uh, year since early 2022 with the theme, Environmental Change and Pacific Salmon Management, the view from both sides of the border. Uh, the series was launched through the Southern Panel uh, and the Coho Tech Committee and is now guided by a steering committee that has representation from across the PSC family. Uh, today's event will be the 10th uh, seminar in the series. That series was intended to provide uh, information on environmental change, uh, its effects on salmon across their life cycle, and salmon management from both Western and Indigenous uh, perspectives. Uh, each event in the series has featured speakers from the United States and Canada, uh, and it's been followed by a facilitated uh, Q&A session, which is what we'll do today as well. Most of these events so far have been offered online, uh, but today's event, like January seminar on the Sailor Sea Marine Survival Project that I know many of you attended, uh, is being held in hybrid mode. So we've got people online, including two presenters uh, and, and other members. Uh, so far, each event has been limited to PSD delegates, uh, but recorded for posting on our public YouTube channel. So if you go to our YouTube channel, you can see all of the recordings uh, from prior events, and the same will be true for today. Uh, but I'm also pleased to announce we've invited our colleagues from the Secretariat at the North Pacific Marine Science Organization, IC, so we've just concluded an MOU with, and the North Pacific Anatomy Fish Commission Secretariat, also in Vancouver, uh, to join online because of their interest in, in the subject matter today. Uh, today's seminar is entitled Assessment and Management Frameworks of the Pacific Salmon Treaty and Their Robustness to Environmental Change. It will relay preliminary findings from the Committee on Scientific Cooperation, or CSC, uh, and their work over the last two years with panels and technical committees to document how the various chapter frameworks inside the treaty incorporate environmental variables and account for ecological change in the treaty area. Uh, our presenters today are Dr. Brendan Connors and Scott McPherson. Uh, Brendan is a research scientist with Fisheries and Oceans Canada, based out of the Institute of Open Sciences uh, on, uh, on Southern Vancouver Island. His background is in salmon population ecology, and his research program at EFO is focused on quantitative methods to understand salmon uh, responses to a warming world, uh, biocomplexity, and mixed stock fisheries in large river basins and fishery risk assessment. Brendan joined the PSC family as the Canadian co-chair of the Committee for Scientific Cooperation back in 2021. Scott McPherson is a fishery scientist retired from the Alaska Department of Fish and Game and lives in Juneau. His background is in stock and fishery assessment, uh, development of quantitative management tools, and in-season management systems. He developed much of the Chinook Stock Assessment Program in Southeast Alaska. Uh, he was also a member of the PSC's CTP, Chinook Technical Committee, for 25 years and part of the Code of Wire Tag Group, the CWT Improvement Team, and presently is the U.S. Co-Chair of our Committee on Scientific Cooperation with Brendan. Uh, so Brendan and Scott today will make joint presentations for about 30 minutes uh, total. Then we'll have a facilitated Q&A session uh, after they are done that will include people that are online as well as those of you here in the room. We'll have microphones going around when that time comes. Um, questions can be submitted uh, um, yeah, for both people uh, online and people here in Portland. So with that, John, I'll turn it over to Brendan, who's going to lead us off. He's our first speaker. Brendan, I hope you can hear me. Yeah, you were coming through loud and clear. How am, how am I on my end, John? Uh, very good. Okay, great. Um, and can people see my full screen? Just triple check in before I fire away. Okay, great. Well, thanks uh, so much to the organizers of the seminar series for the opportunity to uh, give a presentation today. Uh, sorry that Scott and I can't be there in person, but uh, glad we can take advantage of the 
hybrid world we're in these days. Um, as John mentioned, Scott and I are going to tag team this presentation. Uh, but before we get started, wanted to make sure that we acknowledge uh, Brian Beckman with the Northwest Fisheries Science Center who's in the room somewhere there, as well as Diana Dobson, who I think has joined uh, online from DFO, both of who, both of who also serve on the the CSC, we're a party of four, <laughs> uh, as well as Catherine Mickelson and John Field from the Secretariat who serve in kind of like an ex officio status on the committee, all of whom contributed to the report and the material that we're going to be talking about here today. Be remiss if we didn't also thank the CSC liaison group of commissioners, which include Andy Thompson, Rick Klumpf, Bill Auger, and Martin Pache. Uh, all of who helped kind of keep us on task uh, with this assignment over the past couple of years. And lastly, uh, and not leastly, I uh, want to thank many, if not all of you in the room. I can't see who's there, uh, but, you know, members of panels and tech committees who helped review and provide feedback on all the raw material that we've attempted to synthesize as part of this report. So uh, thank you all for your contributions and thanks in advance to those that uh, take a look at what we've produced here and provide some feedback over the coming months during the kind of final review period we have. There we go. Okay, here's a bit of a roadmap for our presentation over the next half an hour. I'm gonna very briefly provide a little bit of background context, um, both for why we were assigned this, uh, but also um, some context around bit large PST fisheries management and assessment frameworks. We're going to touch upon key trends and PST salmon stocks over time to all help set the stage for uh, a brief touching upon of some of the key assessment and management challenges, particularly as they relate to environmental variation and climate change. Um, we're going to touch upon and, and talk about uh, where, when, and how environmental change is or isn't accounted for in assessment and management currently under the PST, and where, when, and how uncertainty is accounted for and conveyed as well as within the PST. And then we'll wrap up with a couple of conclusions uh, and some uh, recommendations around next steps. And there'll be lots of time for questions and discussion after um, our presentation. So as, as comes, of course, no surprise to anyone in the room, and particularly those who have been participating in this uh, seminar series over the past year, you know, climate change is rapidly creating an unpredictable, no analog, quote unquote, future for Pacific salmon as the freshwater and marine environments that they use to complete their life cycles change and are being pushed uh, beyond and outside past limits of observed variation. And we see this in everything from the marine environment with heat waves and overall rising heat content. Uh, for example, catastrophic flooding as a result of atmospheric rivers overlaid on watersheds stressed by wildfire. We see fingerprints of climate change and changing environmental conditions in declining marine survival, uh, which then can also exacerbate uh, mixed stock fishery risks. So we see evidence of this in kind of all the different places we, we work. And um, these impacts and these changes have the potential um, to affect many, if not all, <laughs> aspects of salmon assessment and management. And this schematic here is our attempt at trying to boil that down to its core set of questions that you would typically think about when you're um, trying to go about the business of assessing and managing Pacific salmon. Um, and really these, these revolve around first and foremost, what it is you're trying to achieve. What do you care about? You know, what are management objectives? Um, this in turn helps us answer how many fish uh, do we want to have spawn uh, to meet said objectives. Uh, in order to do that, one then needs to figure out how many fish are actually out there in a given year over a period of time. From that, we can um, provide some advice and assess uh, um, and manage around how many um, fish can be harvested given the set of objectives that we have uh, in a given fishery or system, and then ultimately uh, need to assess how many fish made it to spawning grounds versus those that were harvested. And ultimately comparing what occurred, uh, i.e. how many fish spawned and were harvested in this simplified case against our stated objectives gives us a sense of how effective 
the management and assessment process that's in place is at meeting uh, management objectives. And then, of course, is kind of a classic cycle um, that feeds back into reimagining and rethinking what the management objectives are for the system. And so if, if answering these quote unquote simple questions isn't tricky enough, people have devoted entire careers just to answering a small subset of them. Um, climate change, of course, makes uh, trying to answer them even more difficult. So what we've tried to illustrate here are just some of the key ways in which for each of those questions, um, climate change and environmental variation and increasing environmental variability can impact our ability to try and answer these questions. So for example, if we start up here in the top right, um, climate and environmental related impacts on the survival and growth and maturation of salmon can affect the, our ability to characterize what um, uh, a given stock or population's uh, dynamics are, and then of course our ability to infer or estimate reference points um, that are ultimately used to define management objectives. And that ultimately has consequences for how many fish should spawn. Climate related impacts on survival and distribution can then impact our ability to characterize the size and the uncertainty and the timing of forecasted run size pre-season and our ability to estimate run size and run strength in season, right? All of which affects our perception of how many fish are out there. Um, then we can have climate related impacts on survival and productivity and the distribution of fish, particularly at sea, which in turn can influence things like sustainable harvest rates, vulnerability to fisheries and mixed stock fisheries, um, you know, all of which are challenges that um, influence how many fish can be harvested. If we keep working our way around this cycle here, we're now on the bottom left. Um, all of this, you know, all of these challenges can then affect our ability to count fish, uh, including how many make it to the spawning grounds, as well as how many were harvested. And that can have implications for how many fish actually make it to the spawning grounds or to harvest. And ultimately, all of this can compound and culminate in impacting the ability of a given management strategy and assessment approach to meeting uh, the management objectives that were identified at the beginning. So hoping this just kind of sets a little bit of stage. I recognize this is uh, probably fairly um, basic for most in the room, but just really want to drive home the point that um, increasing environmental variation and climate related driven changes have the potential to impact kind of how we quote unquote do business um, all throughout the decision making and assessment process. So with that, I'm going to hand things over to Scott. Sound check. I sound okay, Brendan? Okay, thank you. Thanks, uh, John and Brendan. Uh, as you might be aware, a couple of years ago, the Committee on Scientific Cooperation was tasked to summarize the current assessment and management frameworks for the PST, identify commonalities and differences in assessment management approaches in those frameworks used across the chapters and the unique or common challenges they face and catalog to the extent that individual chapters incorporate environmental information, account for changes in productivity and account for and convey uncertainty. Um, so we'd like to thank the liaison group for guidance in setting up this approach that we use. The, uh, we develop chapter specific inventories and there's a star there. There are seven management chapters in the PST and those are listed at the bottom in red. And those are what we covered in this exercise. And to make things move along a little bit faster and to have a standardized response, we. We developed inventories that were common as far as you know, individual categories. And then the CSC members and Catherine took our best uh, shot at pre-populating those templates and we provided those to the appropriate panels and technical committees for review. And we'd really like to give a big shout out and thank you for all those members that participated in uh, that exercise and are continuing to do that. 
these chapter inventories appear as appendices to the main body of this report, which has grown to about 160 pages total. And these inventories form the raw material that was synthesized by the CSC in the main body of the report. And as far as the uh, categories covered in the specific inventories, these are again common to all the ones we sent out. Talked about the species and stocks, the fisheries associated with those, management, including the objectives and challenges, the assessment frameworks that were in place for each chapter, the incorporation of environmental information by management tool, accounting for changes in productivity slash survival by management tool, accounting for and conveying uncertainty, and the ability to reach management objectives, and any planned assessment changes in the future to account for climate change. Now, So this is the first of several graphics that you will see. And what we're trying to do is summarize quite a bit of information on one slide. And, um, and now Brendan and Catherine were instrumental in developing these um, graphics. The, uh, I'll note for all of these figures that you're gonna see that look like this, there are 11, chapter slash species combinations. So in some chapters, we did more than one species. So there's seven management chapters, but uh, we've got 11 units in our uh, distillation of the work. The core elements of the assessment frameworks used to establish stock abundance include pre-season forecast or run size. And in the majority of cases, in-season adjustments based on market capture, sonar, test fishing, or other abundance indicators. A quarter of the chapters have reference points for most stocks. The remainder have reference points for some, but not all stocks. Um, prospective evaluation of the ability of assessment and management tools and reference points to meet management objectives. Um, one chapter, the uh, Fraser Sockeye, used simulation, closed loop analysis, and what I call management strategy evaluation to uh, evaluate the efficacy of the uh, current management and assessment program. This is also identified as a priority in two other chapters. This graphic thanks to Brendan, shows the abundance of individual run sizes that we studied, includes most of them anyway, and across the broad spectrum of all species. The, we compared two time frames to get an idea of what kind of basic changes were occurring. The uh, large red numbers, that you see in the top right of each of the small graphs are the percent change in run size for the average from 85 to 95 versus 2008 to 2021. Now the, you can see there's quite a range in uh, variation, but there is a downward trend in, in all cases, uh, ranges from 10 to 60%. And we didn't have space to put the rest of it on there, but uh, the escapements have gone down in most cases from seven to 11%, which is a much smaller figure than the run size that uh, reflects the, uh, the management ability to adjust for run size and, and the abundance-based approaches for management. Harvest rates have also seen a trend that, you know, there's a downward trend from 10 to 65%, depending on which one of these you look at. 
This is a graphic that uh, shows the abundance trends in the three Chinook fisheries that are known as AABM fisheries. Uh, and these are the same differences as far as comparing the 85 to 95 to 2008 to 2021. Uh, and changes here are uh, in relative abundance. It's what the, uh, the model can pick up. It doesn't include all stocks. So this is not absolute numbers, but relative abundance. And the, these are abundance indices and they are, they, they're calculated based on a 1979 to 1982 average and the estimated relative abundance in each individual year compared to that average. So for the, the Southeast Alaska, AABM Chinook fishery, see a change of 24%. For Northern BC, we see a 15% decrease. And for WCVI, we see an 8% um, decrease. Now, I will note that these abundance indices include the standardized model stocks that include both hatchery and wild stocks. And as near as we can tell, the abundance of hatchery stocks has remained relatively constant over this time frame. Okay, on to assessment and management challenges. We have a bit of a list here. So um, the biggest fishery management challenges under the PSC are linked to declining abundances. And we're seeing a decrease in productivity and survival. Especially, well, I, I, you know, in both the marine, but in some cases in the freshwater as well. The decrease in abundance makes it tougher on management and includes uh, at-risk populations, some of which may be listed under the ESA or the uh, program in Canada to protect those stocks. The environmental driven changes in timing and location of returns and perhaps distribution also create management challenges. Lastly, about half of each chapter's ID predation on returning adults as a contributing factor in meeting escapement goals as well. And the reasons cited for escapement goals not being met are decreased productivity and subsequent low returns, high end route losses due to warming waters during return migrations. Here we're looking at in river or terminal areas. Uh, competition at sea with increasing abundances of other species, big salmon, et cetera incidental bycatch and other salmon or non-salmon fisheries and overfishing. And we did mention increased predation in the previous slide. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Brendan and he will take us to home plate. And thank you. Great. Thanks, Scott. So in general for Pacific salmon, um, accounting for environmental and climate driven change and assessment and management can occur through kind of these three core dimensions, if you will. Uh, it can occur through the way in which we go about assessing um, uh, or generating forecasts of preseason um, uh, run size. 
it can uh, it can be accounted for and incorporated in the way in which we go about assessing run size, et cetera, in season and over the, the longer term and more strategically, it can be accounted for in the development of things like reference points and escapement goals, the harvest control rules that are used to inform fisheries management. And importantly for Pacific salmon, when it comes to accounting for environmental and climate driven impacts, um, Compared to other marine fishes, we do have some distinct advantages. We've definitely got some curses and challenges as well. But one of the real distinct advantages is being able to count fish as they return to spawn, uh, which is you know, important for uh, when it comes to thinking about where, when, and how we can, um, we can deal with and account for the influence of the environment and climate change on survival and return abundances. So across the Pacific Salmon Treaty, the, the influence of environmental variability on survival and returns is most often accounted for in um, pre-season run size forecasts. So this whole slide here just kind of boils down and tries to distill where, when, and how um, pre-season run size forecasts um, attempt to account for environmental change and, and, and climate-driven change. The most commonly occurs through the qualitative adjustments to forecasts, which occur in about three quarters of chapters. So that's that top row there. Um, information on juvenile production is also often used, at least for some stocks, in about, um, well, a little over half of the chapters. Uh, and that helps to indirectly account for, the cha for changes in freshwater productivity when um, deriving forecasts. So it allows for at least an accounting of a component of environmental uh, processes that shape survival throughout the life cycle. Um, somewhat less extensively, uh, climate and environmental driven impacts on returns can be accounted through the quantitative incorporation of environmental variables. That's that third bar down. Um, and then in about two thirds or yeah, just over two thirds of chapters, forecasts are often based on recent data uh, and recent survival estimates, uh, or they're adjusted to account for recent bias between what was predicted pre-season and what was observed to return uh, post-season, They're, thereby at least attempting to try and take recent environmental conditions into account when generating um, pre-season forecasts. Um, of course, with Pacific salmon that have variable age structure, those species that do sibling models where observed abundance of early maturing salmon from a given brood year can be used to predict the abundance of their older siblings returning the following year. Those are commonly used uh, in preseason forecasts for at least some stocks in about three quarters uh, of the chapters. And that's this uh, second to the bottom column here uh, or row. And then lastly, in contrast to these other ways in which environmental information is incorporated, it's much less common for changes in productivity to be taken directly into account uh, when uh, preseason forecasts are generated. So in-season assessments, if we kind of transition from pre-season now to in-season and then, and then more strategic longer term uh, dimensions of assessment and management. From an in-season perspective, uh, assessments are routinely used across uh, the PST to assess sockeye and pink and chum salmon, as well as uh, Yukon, Chinook and chum. Um, they're also used to assess some uh, of the coho and transboundary Chinook stocks and are in development for some Chinook stocks covered under chapter three, which is the coastwide Chinook chapter. The advantage of in-season assessments is that they help to at least in part circumvent the need to account for changes in freshwater or ocean survival by assessing a number of adult salmon um, that are actually returning and hence potentially available for harvest uh, when those in-season assessments occur in areas that proceed where the harvest occurs, of course. Uh, but in some instances, there's an additional need to account for changes in adult survival during freshwater return migrations, for example, to ensure that escapement goals are met. Examples of that would be in the Fraser River, for example, with sockeye, as well as in, um, in the Yukon for Chinook and Chum. You know, and those are systems that have long, extensive freshwater migrations, and particularly in the case of Fraser sockeye, where there's a long history of uh, characterizing the relationship between migration conditions and uh, en route or um, uh, on spawning ground survival. Right, in these cases, environmental conditions can be used to either quantitatively adjust in-season assessments of run size or at least qualitatively adjust them based on migration conditions. And this occurs in about a third of the chapters um, as illustrated with the bottom bar here. 
Um, now, while accounting for environmental conditions and forecasts and in-season assessments can make, you know, attempting to meet annual management goals in the face of a changing climate more feasible in theory for Pacific salmon compared to other species, the extent to which changes in productivity have been considered in the development of benchmarks and reference points that are used to define management goals has, has definitely been um, more limited. Uh, and that's what these top four bars um, uh, attempt to unpack across the PSC chapters. So when environmental conditions are accounted for, uh, it's typically done by adjusting reference points based on um, pronounced changes in productivity. For example, by only uh, calculating or re-estimating reference points from a recent period from a spawn or recruit relationship. So some uh, examples of that would be, for example, like interior Fraser Coho uh, in the in the Fraser River. Um, and so the second bar from the bottom uh, illustrates that about half of the chapters do this for at least some stocks uh, or it's at least under, un, under consideration in development um, when it comes to adjusting reference points based on very pronounced changes, almost like regime type changes in productivity. It's much less common for reference points to directly take environmental conditions into account. And that's what's highlighted here in this middle bar with the extensive uh, purple, uh, with only Fraser Sockeye doing this uh, via explicitly allowing fishing mortality to vary as a function of um, the quality of freshwater um, migration conditions, return migration conditions. Of course, collecting life stage specific abundance data, either from hatchery fish or wild fish, smolts, or in the case of pink salmon from fry, um, that, that can also be used and that occurs for some indicators uh, or under indicator systems in about three quarters of the chapters. And this allows for estimating life stage specific survival and the tracking of both freshwater um, and marine productivity survival over time, which can help parse what the drivers of changes are over time uh, and if, where, and how to account for it when it comes to reference points. So that's the second to the top um, bar. And then lastly, management strategy performance is commonly evaluated across PST chapters by comparing realized escapements against uh, escapement goals or harvest rates against harvest rate limits, um, either annually over or across um, several recent years. Um, while this allows for like a rear view retrospective evaluation of the performance of the annual assessment and management frameworks that are in place, including you know, implicitly um, how well they're performing in the face of past environmental change, it doesn't allow for a prospective or forward-looking evaluation of the appropriateness of reference points or harvest control rules or escapement goals to meeting management objectives given long-term or short-term changes in productivity, uh, increased environmental variation, et cetera. Right? And so the, that type of prospective evaluation of risk uh, really only occurs currently for Fraser Sockeye through management, as formal ma management strategy evaluation, but not shown here, but it is under consideration in a couple of other chapters. Um, okay, so uncertainty is a pervasive and uh, very well ra recognized aspect of fisheries management. But if and how it's accounted for and conveyed, conveyed to decision makers varies tremendously across fisheries and regions and species. And there are multiple dimensions to uncertainty in salmon assessment and management. And this perhaps overly complicated schematic uh, adapted from a colleague of ours, Randall Peterman from back in the early 2000s, attempts to try and illustrate this. Really, all I want you to focus in on is just the red text. Uh, and that boils down four core dimensions of uncertainty in salmon and assessment um, uh, frameworks and systems. The first source of uncertainty is natural variation. So that's up here in the top left. And that's natural variation in both the physical and biological uh, processes that shape that system. The second source of uncertainty is because of imperfect data collection and assessment, right? That ari uh, um, arises because of, you know, incomplete uh, measurements, uh, observation error that are, you know, common part of uh, the imperfect way in which we observe the natural world. The third source of uncertainty, which we call structural uncertainty here, is because of our incomplete understanding of how a system functions. So, you know, we build a model 
it could be quantitative or qualitative of how we think the world works. But of course, that's only an imperfect approximation of that. And the extent to which we get it right or wrong refers to um, structural uncertainty. And then lastly, all the way over here in the bottom left is outcome uncertainty. And this is uncertainty um, in how well a given management objective, for example, an escapement goal, is achieved by a given management action, for example, a total allowable catch or a harvest control rule. So all four sources of uncertainty uh, are common in salmon assessment and management. And if those uncertainties weren't already complicated enough and make the business of uh, working with salmon complicated enough, climate change can exacerbate all four forms of them. So an example would be by increasing variation in physical and biological processes. Um, another example would be by making it harder to reliably collect data or observe how many fish are out there, and count them, et cetera. Um, it can uh, reduce our understanding of how a system functions as systems change states or start to break and behave in ways that we haven't observed and characterized in the past. And of course, uh, climate change can also make it harder for our management actions to achieve a stated set of management objectives. These challenges are not new. Uh, they're not unique to salmon. Uh, and in light of this, you know, there are people who've spent whole careers thinking about where, when, and how to better account for and convey risk associated with different dimensions of uncertainty. And we can boil that down into a couple of a particularly germane best practices when it comes to Pacific salmon. The first is formalized communication of uncertainty, the different dimensions of it, and the risks associated with it. So that's through things like decision tables or risk matrices. Um, another is to test the assessment and management procedures that are in place for their robustness to these different sources of uncertainty. And that can be through decision analysis, it can be through simulation, it could be through management strategy evaluation that we've highlighted a couple of ways. There's lots of different ways to do it, but the idea there is it's about in silica, you know, not in the real world, like in a flight simulator, uh, thinking about um, how well the way in which we observe the world and react to it, um, uh, how, how robust it is to different sources of uncertainty. When it comes to dealing with uncertainty um, in PSC assessment and management, uh, this slide tries to boil down uh, where, when, and how that occurs. The first is that Preseason forecasts uh, commonly include associated statements of uncertainty, right? That's primarily driven by natural variation, but also some structural uncertainty. Um, and that is highlighted down here uh, with quantitative accounting of uncertainty in preseason's for forecasts, the bottom bar. Um, In-season assessments also commonly include quantitative estimates of uncertainty that are typically largely reflecting the measurement error or observation error associated with, um, uh, with assessing how many fish are there uh, in season. That's highlighted here in the second bar. Uncertainty arising from natural variation and measure, measurement error is also, also, excuse me, often accounted for to some extent when deriving escapement goals and reference points that make up harvest control rules. And that's highlighted here. You know, it's a bit more of a mixed bag in terms of the extent to which uncertainty is accounted for in those reference points, but still in the vast majority of chapters, it either occurs uh, for some stocks or is under development. And then lastly, while overall performance of management measures in meeting fishery and conservation objectives is evaluated retrospectively for most chapters, as we mentioned earlier, formal risk assessment and the a systematic evaluation of the robustness of decision making to uncertainty is, is quite uncommon. And that's what's highlighted up here in the top bar. Okay, we're around in the bend here on the home stretch. Um, overall, uh, our review, this report illustrates that in comparison to other fisheries, the annual assessments of Pacific salmon across PSC chapters generally attempt, I want to underscore attempt, to account for environmental and climate driven impacts on survival using some fairly salmon specific tools such as in season assessments and to a certain extent through pre season run size forecasts that account for changes in survival and include environmental information in different ways, shapes, and forms. But I want to emphasize the word attempts because as everyone is 
probably painfully aware, relationships between the environment and survival and other dimensions of salmon dynamics are becoming increasingly unreliable. Um, sibling relationships, as an example, are not always available for all species, so those can't be exploited uh, to the way uh, that they can for others. And not all fisheries and not all systems are amendable to, to in-season assessments. Um, and what we see as, uh, as the CSC and the group who tried to chew on and distill all this uh, as a key challenge moving forward is ensuring that the kind of annual management goals and associated reference points with them are selected appropriately given anticipated climate driven impacts on salmon growth and distribution and survival and ultimately abundance. And we see this as an area with considerable room for improvement. Uh, along with uh, improvement of the communication of and accounting for risk as a result of the uncertainties associated with climate change. Now, in terms of immediate next steps, a, a draft of this report uh, and all the chapter specific appendices and their gory details has been sent out to um, all the panels and tech committees and commissioners. So I think hopefully everybody in the room has, has either uh, seen it or heard of it being around and it's out for further review and comment. Uh, and we wanna thank everybody in advance uh, for any and all constructive uh, feedback you can provide. We've got a hard deadline uh, of April 1st um, for further comments, at which point uh, we as a group will incorporate the feedback and, and publish this report through the PSC special report series. But more generally, when it comes to next steps beyond those immediate finishing the report ones, you know, despite, excuse me, despite our conclusions on that earlier slide, our, our report does not make specific forward-looking recommendations because we recognize that there need, these need to be developed in close partnerships with panels and tech committees to be meaningful, to be effectively adopted and to be used. Right? And so what we're recommending as a group uh, is that this report be followed up with a multi-year process that works with and engages members of panels and tech committees to both discuss the material that's in there and chew on it, to deliberate on specific, you know, chapter specific opportunities to improve the adequacy and resp responsiveness of, of the tools that are in place uh, um, to deal with climate driven change. And ultimately to develop chapter specific feedback from the PSC membership for both parties to consider ahead of renegotiation of the, ne the next PSC in a few years time. So we really see that as the key next step. Uh, this was just a, this, the work that we've done so far is a stepping stone along that journey, if you will. Uh, and there's a proposal under, consider, under consideration right now by the endowment funds to support such a kind of multi-year effort. And we recognize as a committee that any effort like this requires planning and coordination from panels and tech committees. We recognize everybody is already stretched very thin. And so we're intentionally trying to take a fairly thoughtful multi-year perspective on this in the hopes that um, uh, there's an opportunity to kind of meaningfully and more fully and further um, engage with the subject. So with that, I uh, just wanna thank everybody for taking your lunch to, uh, to join us and hear a little bit about the report that we've put together. Uh, and I'll stop sharing my screen and uh, turn things back over to the MC in the room for uh, a Q&A session. Thank you. This is uh, Gary Morishima. Uh, very uh, helpful presentation. One of the, uh, the issues that I was curious about is does the CFD get the issues of granularity? Because many of the, uh, the chapters and the conclusions that have been presented are sort of species specific or perhaps area specific. Uh, while a lot of the issues that we have to deal with within this project deals with uh, finer scale. And what are the impacts on the individual stocks? Um, 
in terms of uh, diversity having a great deal of impact in terms of the resiliency of the civic center to some of the stresses of environmental change. Thank you very much for the comment, Gary. I had a, we had a little bit of a hard time getting the 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 whole meat of your comment uh, just with the, with the audio. So I don't know if uh, Marisa or whoever's got the mic, if somebody could just recap or redistill Gary's uh, question, then we'll we'll do our best to answer it. But yeah, sorry, we just didn't catch all of it, and I don't want to I don't want to presuppose what you were trying to ask, Gary. Brandy, can you hear me? Yes. So I'll walk back over here. His question had to do with the granularity of the analysis and sort of the fine scale um, details of each stock and chapter and that specific level of um, review. Yeah, thanks, um, Scott. If it's all right, I'll I'll, I'll start things off here, and uh, I'll encourage you to to jump in. So, I, I mean, I think you're you are right, Gary. That uh, particularly what we highlighted here, which is at a very kind of coarse scale, kind of distilling commonalities, differences across chapters, does gloss over some of the specificity and granularity that is both, you know foundational to Pacific Salmon, uh, but also, you know, is a, is a big part of what happens in the chapters. I'd say some of that material is captured in the details, particularly in the appendices, but also I think a big part of thinking about um, that granularity is not to, you know, kick this down the road, but I think that is really kind of about a next step. This was about a, trying to take a fairly synoptic across the board look uh, that then hopefully serves as a foundation for digging into the details, the exceptions, the challenges, the opportunities. Um, and so we really see that as an important part of the next steps and working with those that really know the systems, the chapters, the assessment and management frameworks in a way that, you know, Scott and I um, and, and others that, that worked on this would probably couldn't ever hope to, to really know after, um, you know, a career of working, except for Scott, who's got it dialed in uh, in the transboundary region. So I don't know, Scott, if you want to add anything to that. No, uh, I think you captured that pretty well, Brendan, but I would just reinforce that this is just a, a foundation overview, high level document. And we did mention earlier that our intended next steps are to go to more chapter specific details and that would be the time to uh, deal with that sort of thing and, and Gary I hope that answers what you're asking about thank you Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, my question is, as you look across the constellation of approaches, um, did anything jump out as something that was going to break first? Or does it feel like things are kind of all going to break at the same time? Is there any sort of um, hot spots that you all identified for intervention? Or did you feel like it was roughly global to our address? Uh, Marissa, would you mind repeating that? Okay, so I'm going to try. Um, I think the question was also a question um, that were there any, as you went across the different chapters, were there any hot spots? Were there any? Um, Specifics that look like it might be first, or is there a kind of a common pattern of challenge across chapters? Are you getting kind of okay? Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah that's kind of Well, apparently, one of the first places is like this high resolution. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, thanks. Uh, thanks for uh, redistilling it there. And you know, I think um, I'll, I'll just take a stab to start. 
Uh, I wouldn't say that there is any single one place or challenge that is unequivocally the place where things are going to break first. I think where things are the most stretched are where there are, you know, uh, where salmon and the assessment and management frameworks around them are most acutely feeling the the um, the effects of climate change right now. Tip, typically, you know, if I can paint a broad brush, tends to be more at more southern latitudes, particularly in systems where you've got acute freshwater related degradation over, you know, that's being overlaid with acute um, uh, climate driven change. And then in instances where uh, assessment and management is working with pretty incomplete information, uh, right? I, I think as you mentioned in your question, it's a real constellation of uh, uh, ways in which information is gathered and decisions are made. And that also varies at different scales. Uh, and so I would say that at more Southern latitudes and instances where there is really limited information are the places where things are probably strained the most, but uh, it, you know, much like uh, salmon are incredibly diverse, uh, so are, all of the nuances of the chapters and the broad geographic scale at which the PST operates. And we see signatures of climate-driven change uh, all the way up in the Yukon right now. Uh, so it's not just a Southern latitude type, um, type problem or most acute problem. Um, I don't know, I, I hope that helps a little bit um, uh, with your question. I think it's a, it's a good one and it's a logical place to turn to next, particularly as one is thinking about individual chapters as what are the pieces that are most vulnerable and sensitive to um, an imperfect understanding of the way the world works uh, or to climate driven change. And I think that touches upon a little bit on our points around this kind of prospective forward looking evaluation of uh, how robust the way in which we go about uh, doing our business is to um, uncertainty brought on by environmental and climate driven change. Let me try, so can you hear this for a minute? Yeah, I, I can, thanks Brian. I think after we talk, it the volume dampens down in the room on the owl and then it slowly starts coming up. So um, yeah. So we're using a handheld mic so not the owl, so maybe there's some uh, competition between that. We'll get John Sun for maybe a suggestion on how to uh, make it better for the staff. Yeah. I don't think there's yeah. much you can do. Okay. Do you want to have people move to the front? Um, um, let's let's try just having people speak up uh, as much as they can at the microphone, and if we have problems, I, I can try to rephrase them. This might help too. We have the speaker closer to the to the mic. I can just project. <clears throat> Uh, I think as a follow up to that, then, and I, I think I sense where you're going to go given the main directive is to shoot you back out, let the group sneak amongst themselves. But which of those yellow bars do you want to see grow first? Or do they all need to grow all at once? It's an all hands on deck. There's not going to be a single solution you need to think about operating. Differently in many different ways. There, there's no silver bullet, but which is the silverest? <laughs> so, Brendan, I don't know if you caught that. Yep. Yeah, I, I got that pretty good. Scott, did did you hear that? Do you want to field this one, or do you want me to take it? Could you repeat it for me, Brendan? Yeah, the question is: Are are there specific uh, um, dimensions that need to be focused on the most first you know and the analogy was used we've got our our horizontal bars and which which bars need the yellow to grow the quickest uh relative to others and are there some core elements of assessment and management that are you know unequivocally the most important to focus our collective efforts on first relative to others well how about if i take a first stab at it and you can clean up my mess um well, first off, um, I, I think the, it was mentioned earlier in the presentation, but where we have in-season information, uh, you know, certainly the, the gold standard is probably the Fraser sockeye system, but where you have, you know, a lot of in-season updates, um, that 
that takes away some of the other elements of uh, uncertainty that Brendan talked about earlier. So the more elements of uncertainty that you can eliminate, the better off you are. And to go hand in hand with that, be prepared. Uh, and by being prepared, you have to have those elements that you can have in place and do a good job at your assessment data. Um, put resources into that. If, you, if you've got data gaps, fill those. Uh, in, this, in these days and times, uh, we still have fish to manage and catch. And, and uh, I think doing those kind of things are, are a start. It doesn't fully address all the bars or anything, but that, that's just a start. And Scott, I think you're bang on. And I'll just add a couple of reflections that come to mind um, from, from, the, from the question and, and your response. You know, things vary tremendously across different parts of the chapters. And so what this, I know we mentioned this earlier, but what the solution is or where it makes the most sense to invest effort early on is going to vary uh, depending on the specifics of what's practically feasible um, within each system. But I think it's also really important to keep in mind, and I, 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 I suspect and I appreciate everybody is probably acutely aware of this, is that all the things that we're talking about here, even if we were doing them perfectly, aren't going to make the challenges posed by climate change go away. Uh, they, they can't reverse <laughs> climate change. They can simply make the assessment and management frameworks that are in place more robust to those consequences. And I think that's really important to keep in mind. And then of course, more generally, because you'd highlight, you'd ask the question around, or the question earlier was around granularity and diversity. You know, I think generally writ large, there's a pretty clear perspective in the resource management world that protecting all the cogs in the wheel, the pieces in the system from the processes that generate the habitats to the diversity that underpin salmon populations are, you know, protecting that uh, and ensuring that it stays there is, you know, a cornerstone of trying to keep salmon resilient in the face of climate change. Any other questions for Scott and Brennan? Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm going to stand right here with that young lady in the midst of me. <laughs> to, to someone that has managed these fisheries, basically been around it all my adult life. From the leadership of my brother Guy McMines and Jerry Morrison and Jim Hart and Joe Del Cruz and all the tribal leaders from where I'm from. The question about the granularity that, that um, Gary um, was kind of dialing in on, that's exactly what we have to do. And I appreciate this presentation as someone that has struggled through managing of our fisheries and the responsibilities that we, that we have that really centralizes around uh, a, a, con a conservative approach. Um, the disappearance of our coho in 2015, um, at least for us at Quinal, was real graphic. They, they, you know, we had robust forecast and it came back. And when we looked at the other river systems in the Bolt Case area, in other words, the North Washington coast, the Straits of Montecrete and Puget Sound, some did, some did. In in the Hood Canal, for instance, for the Skokomish tribe, they came back one pounders by the scores. So I I really appreciate this last presentation about you know what you talked about in management here. And these cells that reflect back to our duty, for instance, in the southern panel. Um, or or any sector of management of these resources. So to me, it's how do we apply that? And one of the things that I think about is what have we already experienced? 
because as it's pointed out, you go all the way from the Yukon, which is catastrophic failure. Then you have similarities in the Cuscoquim, and then you just apply that those lessons over this last, I don't know how, how long, at least a decade of that demonstrated change. And when you get to our area, I mean, I think our 20 tribes um, from the bulk case area can really look at what was forecasted, what did we do, what was the end result. Now, I, I'm, I don't know what that's really going to tell me, but it really makes sense to me that when you when you overlay that with a lot of the information, which we already do in the notes presentation of that warm ocean, right? When we see that, the coloration, El Nino, La Nina, you know, I'll, I guess really I'm, I'm just making a statement here that says we need to take this kind of exercise and figure out how to apply it, how to apply it for all of us. Because we know us down south here, we're not rebuilding our stocks. They are not rebuilding. You know, and, and the mission here is for the country of origin to enjoy the the ability to to um, get the benefit of those stocks. So North, Canada, South. And for us down south, we're not enjoying those benefits. So this is a vital component of the other things. Add that to it, to how we're going to rebuild these stocks. Without climate, we had a chance. I mean, I was here when they said, my Grace Harbor ship, we're going to build in two and a half cycles. I was thinking with me and my fellow fishermen, how great it was going to be in 1997. We're going to be in the land of plenty. That didn't happen. And we asked why. And we get complexity and answers. But those were in the days when we didn't really realize what was coming at us. Now it's here. So as, as someone that um, steps out of of, of, of harvest management and, and trying to work with those that are still in harvest management and have a responsibility in the southern panel. How do we get to the granularity that Gary's talking about? Because that's the ball game. That's the ball game here. And we're going to make mistakes. It's just going to happen. So in our dialogue and our responsibility to, to this work that we do, everybody has to know that, right? We got to mitigate against those mistakes by what we do, when we do them, and why we do it. We got to put a little more in there for that that possibility. We got to put a little more in there for the fish for their resiliency that has changed over time. You know, I really appreciate the work. Thanks. Anyone else follow up? Lori. I was just wondering if you guys felt like there were any big surprises in going through this information, things that you didn't expect, given, especially uh, Scotty, having been part of the PNC for a long time, involved in salmon management for a long time, that really stood out as, you know, not what you thought you were going to get with these results. Since she said your first, uh, your name first, Scotty, I'm going to let you go first, <laughs> and I can follow up if you like. Well, it to me it was uh, interesting to 
to look at the the commonalities actually across the chapters. Um, you don't want to hear about that. You want to hear about what really surprised me. But one thing was, you know, everybody had an abundance-based approach by chapter, um, which the treaty didn't totally start out that way, but it ended up that way. And some of the other tools that were intriguing um, to me, I, I think using the, uh, the MSC, the management strategy evaluation or another simulation approach that would be similar to that. And, and use, incorporating some more of that information, you know, like where they do have in-season uh, updates to take all that information and further enhance it by giving the managers the, the potential, the, the probability of reaching their management objectives, given what they've got for in-season information and what stage they're at. And uh, I, I think a little bit of that um, could be added pretty easily just with some modeling with the existing data. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Brendan. Thanks, Scott. I mean, I think my my comments are very similar, and it's it's a great question, um, Lori. I, I have three things I want to highlight. One is, I was a bit surprised at how looking across all the chapters, the challenges that are out there have all been they've been so, they've been quite rigorously solved by at least somebody in some place at some point. And so there's quite a bit of learning that can be had across chapters in a way that I wasn't as appreciative of going into this. I was also surprised at the extent to which there's information on kind of life stage specific abundance across chapters. I recognize these are often for just a very small sub subset of indicator systems, but I was surprised at the geographic scope of that uh, and the potential for that to be uh, better and more completely leveraged when it comes to dealing with the challenges posed by climate change and disentangling uh, um, uh, processes that are contributing to the dynamics we see. And then I, lastly, I was surprised at how how little prospective evaluation there's been of the current assessment and management um, approaches to the suite of pervasive uncertainties that are out there. And I see that as a real area, um, as Scott just highlighted, that um, uh, some effort could be placed in the future that uh, at least pl puts everybody in a, in a more informed place about um, the pros and cons and risks and benefits associated with different ways of assessing and, and making decisions. Hi, uh, Jeremy Maynard, Southern Panel. I have a much simpler question, just in the book, uh, being best able to understand the information you're presenting. Um, on slide 12, uh, there's a middle uh, column that's called changing demographics. Does that refer to changes in the age structure of salmon stocks uh, against previous observed patterns? Yes, you hit the nail on the head. So this is changes in age and size and sex ratios, particularly see that in Chinook and the concern for the consequences that might have for reproductive potential um, uh, within those stocks, particularly in systems where if you've seen systematic changes in those over time and your uh, reference points and uh, escapement goals are based on a period of time when there were bigger, older, say, for example, more fecund females, then the question becomes, how representative is, um, is that of today? And are there risks associated with managing without taking that into account? Thank you. I would just like to add uh, that that was, again, like Brendan said, most pervasive in Chinook salmon, but it also, it goes from the Yukon all the way down to at least the, the Southern Oregon coast. Um, it, it didn't uh, pick on just anybody, it picked on everybody. And, uh, and, I, and I also think that it uh, highlights the need for some of the information that Brendan touched on 
we're using, um, what are we getting out of the uh, decreased size and, and eggs in the gravel? Is that really a direct one-to-one uh, -one correlation in, in productivity lost or is it you know, on the curve? So that you know, just points out the need for some more you know, carefully done freshwater productivity studies. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Well, then I've got the questions here for the moment. We got 10 minutes. 30 seconds. The focus. Focus. It's better. It's better. The focus here in these slides and in the conversation has been on the biophysical. How are the rivers and the fish changing as things warm? There's a whole human component of environmental variability that stands to affect the fisheries and how they're managed. Where I live, diesel has gotten expensive. Wheat electrification is a long ways off. Is that stuff out of bounds or should that be in bounds? Thinking about that diagram on slide five, where we're thinking about what are the forces? We've drawn a nice box around the world that we're in, but there's all these other things that are gonna that are outside that box that can totally perturb that box. Was that part of the conversation? Should that be part of the conversation going forward? Well, I think that's a pretty rhetorical question, you know, guiding how we want to take this in the next phase that Brendan and Scott opened up with. If we're successful. The, the endowment funds will be able to launch that sort of conversation with our panels and technical committees uh, over the next year, year and a half. What have we learned from this report and where do we want to take it? Should there be you know, non fishing factors uh, brought in to, to that conversation? The treaty has a certain prescribed remit, um, and I think that would got a lot of the countries thinking, but. Um, I don't think anyone, at least that I've heard on the, the CSC, is foreclosing conversations. So we have pledged to go to about 1.30. Um, we do have a few more minutes left if people want to ask questions. Or if Scott and Brendan had concluding thoughts. I I had a couple that I wanted to share. That, they're not real uh, cerebral, but just that the report when it comes out in April, I think serves a couple of purposes at least. One is to um, allow people to dig into this concept of how the treaty is doing and dealing with environmental change and conveying uncertainty. But it also, I think the report will be a good primer for people coming into the process, learning how each chapter deals with in-season, pre-season, post-season, uh, analysis. It is sort of your one stop shop now to learn how the different chapters of the treaty work. Um, and the other point I was going to make was what I just said that this hopefully won't be the end of the conversation, it would just be the beginning of where we, where we go from here, meaning the negotiations that are due to happen, I assume, in 2027 and 2028. Uh, Brendan and Scott, that's all I had. But Perhaps, I don't know if others from the steering committee want to speak. Lori, did you want to have a few words about next seminar? Sure. So the March seminar is March 22nd, and we've got a speaker from BC Trip talking about the type of projects they've been funding. And then Bill Templin is going to be talking about the Alaska wild salmon policy. So stay tuned. That would be, we're now back to virtual. So, uh, we will get the links if you register. So stay tuned March 22nd, Wednesday, 2 to 3 30. And thank you for coming. This is great. This is really good.
Okay, with that, we'll see everyone in the halls or uh, or elsewhere. Thanks all. Have a great rest of your meeting.